Okay, today is October 2nd, 2012. This is the end of learning unit two. And there's not a lot to cover today, and we're going to attempt to perhaps get through it sooner than usual and maybe get out of here a little early. Um, but learning unit two had chapters 10 and 13 of Fowler's book. I went over that in some detail last week. I've also posted it on YouTube for your review if you choose. And the next part of Learning Unit 2, which ends today, is a number of readings about children's developmental stages, how the typical child develops. And the first item for your review is something called Cognitive Milestones. And again, this is obviously directed at the typical child. There's variability, as we discussed last week, in child development. But by age one, kids can follow objects with their eyes. Um, they can recognize differences among people. Certainly, they can recognize the difference between their caregivers, uh, especially their mom and other people in their life. Uh, they imitate facial expressions. They can respond to very simple directions as they approach one. And they're big imitators. They imitate gestures and actions. And they can demonstrate some intent, especially when putting objects into boxes or shapes along with other shapes those kinds of rudimentary tasks kids up to age one uh, can accomplish. You get a, a little bit more ability between one and two and this is what the milestone list is all about here. Now you get kids up to age two, uh, they imitate the words of adults. Now they may repeat what they hear, they can follow simple very familiar directions they can respond to your directions or commands in an appropriate way in some cases. They are able to follow a storybook with pictures. Um, they have a very short attention span and that, you know, that's a problem throughout childhood, but especially uh, preschoolers and one and two year olds have the shortest attention span. And they learn through their own exploration. At two and three, kids can respond to simple directions. They um, can interact more with picture books and objects than they could at one and two. So between two and three, they certainly are better able to pick out a book, to point to a picture, to express their desires about books and objects and things like that. They know that they are themselves when they look in a mirror. They can recognize themselves in a mirror. They can express themselves briefly about what they're doing at any particular time. And as always and throughout childhood and life, sometimes they imitate adults. That limited attention span is still there. Moving up to three and four, kids begin to understand their colors. They can draw a picture, uh, especially if it's meaningful to the child, if it's something in their life, something relevant to them, if not to the adult. They can draw a somewhat recognizable picture. They begin to ask questions. They begin to offer us that why question. They want information. Why and how questions become dominant. Um, those questions that require simple answers. They, they know their own age, they certainly know their name, but they continue to have a short attention span. And they begin to become aware of the present and the past in a rudimentary way. Between four and five, they begin to have more words. They create their own words, their own rhyming words. They can make up words that have similar sounds. They can know up to four to six colors. They can imitate adults in counting, but it's very rote. You know, they can say one, two, three, four, five, maybe a little more than that, but not much more. And that's not analytical, it's rote, it's mechanical. 
nevertheless, they can accomplish that. Their attention span is better than the one and two-year-olds and three-year-olds, and we're talking about four and five-year-olds. They begin to talk about the past and the future. They begin to appreciate yesterday and tomorrow, begin to appreciate it. Now, between five and six, you begin to develop, the child begins to develop a greater degree of competency. They can tell us a story that we read to them with pretty good accuracy. They can recount it to us, whether it's the Dora the Explorer or the Bernstein Bears or some other story. They can begin to recount narratives. They know the names of some letters and numbers. They can get up to ten now. Again, it's still mechanical. It's still rote. The clock starts to have a meaning in their lives. It begins to be related to their schedule. And their attention span is significantly better than two and three and four and five-year-olds. Between five and six, um, they're beginning to be able. And by able, I mean forensically able. Uh, between five and six, you can get a narrative from a child about past events. And that's what the legal system needs. That's what the basis of most of these legal proceedings is, that the witness is able to recall past events and communicate them in a way that makes sense. And at six years old, five and six, kids are beginning to be able to do that. And what's most important forensically is they're, they're, they're able to, in most cases, to give a sequential narrative. And that means telling about something that happened from the beginning through the middle to the end. Now, there's lots of variability, as I said in the past. You know, there's some six-year-olds who do really well, and there's some six-year-olds that can't give you a narrative at all. They have the ability of a typical four-year-old. But these are general considerations about cognitive milestones. Some of you I saw have read Mindy Mitnick's cognitive development uh, chart. And we were looking at cognitive milestones. Um, Ms. Mitnick gets into more details about child development here and looks at, in a more focused way, about how kids see the world around them how their thinking goes and she makes the observation that from three to five their thinking is very egocentric and this is important in forensic interviewing you will see egocentricity rear its head throughout this course it is important to appreciate egocentricity in forensic interviewing because it affects how we ask questions of children the assumptions we make about how children understand us and children's communication with us is sometimes impacted by their egocentricity. And what we mean by that is they can't take the viewpoint of others. They don't realize that other people might have different thoughts, different beliefs, different ideas, different points of view than they do. 
I expect that you'll see some video clips that demonstrates this egocentricity. But children tend to see the whole world as revolving around them, especially preschoolers. And they believe that what they lived, what they experienced, what happened to them, everybody knows about. So if a child that age is being interviewed by a forensic interviewer, that child has made a host of assumptions about what that interviewer knows. They think the interviewer knows everything about their life, who their teacher is, where they live, what time they get up, what they watch on TV, what their mommy's name is, what their daddy's name is. And that's referred to as egocentricity. And it's very pronounced in preschoolers. Three to five, their thinking is not only egocentric, but pre-logical. The typical child that age cannot explain their own thinking. They can report events, but they don't understand cause and effect. Their understanding of events is pre-logical and their explanations are typically not helpful just because. And if you ask them how is it that you know that, you'll get confusing answers and nonsensical answers many times. Because their thinking is pre-logical. They don't have the ability yet, nor the experience, to understand the interrelatedness of the human experience of life, of events, of the things around us. You know, you have to be in a rainstorm or two to understand what an umbrella is, right? You know, that object has no meaning to someone who never been around rain. And although that's not the best example, my point is that children are developing. They're experiencing life and events. And as they experience more and more events, they begin to connect the dots. And preschoolers are so young that, number one, they don't have the cognitive ability to connect the dots, nor the life's experience to understand cause and effect and the interrelatedness of events. And because of that, they often engage in what Ms. Mitnick calls juxtaposition. Because they don't understand cause and effect, they scramble it sometimes. So therefore, it rained because Joe took his umbrella from the house into the parking lot. Rather than I had my umbrella because it was raining, they see the cause of the rain as being the umbrella. And that kind of makes sense because whenever I leave the house with the umbrella, it starts to rain. Or is raining. And sometimes they confabulate other unrelated concepts because they don't understand cause and effect. Preschoolers' thinking is also syncretic. Syncretic means they sometimes take two or three experiences and fuse them as if they were one experience. The margins of their experiences. Uh, are non-existent sometimes, or fused with the margins of other experiences. So their day in school, and their day at home, and their day at grandma's, you know, might be one cognitive blob, where when they report things about their experience that day, they can mix up and interchange events from school, mommy's house, and grandma's house as if they were one event. Or they may think they're describing a singular event during a time period. For example, explaining how they ate oatmeal with jam in it at mommy's, and in fact that was at grandma's.
and in the world of forensic interviewing of children, if it's abusive events that we're concerned about, you know, they may merge separate events into one another as if they happened at the same time or at the same place or with the same person. So we need to be very vigilant in questioning children because they have that syncretic type of thinking when they're preschoolers. You know, especially with things they don't understand, like human sexuality. Their communication is egocentric. And I think I touched upon this a little while ago. Not only do they think the whole world revolves around them, they think everybody experiences what they do. They don't take the listener's needs into account. That they don't live in their house. They don't know their mommy. They don't know their dog. Lady Gaga. I don't think it was this class. I think the next class has a pet, Lady Gaga. I have video clips of this egocentricity. It's pretty fascinating to watch. But I had I had a girl once who I don't know if I saw the video or I was preparing her for tri- trial. And she was she was older, not much older, but she was about seven. She presented as older. She was a bit precocious. She was a city kid. And she's like, I don't know if I was questioning her or the interviewer. My thinking is a little syncretic right now. I says, I think this is the case where she was molested by her mother's boyfriend and the police pulled up on the car in Eastside Park and they thought it was a couple necking or fooling around and they pulled up and the car took off and they saw a little girl's head and they, it was a big chase. And I think I or the interviewer said to the girl, you know, where, where did it first start or what part of the neighborhood was it? And she said, well, we were over there by Scooby-Doo's and then we went around the block and we went over there. I said, oh, wait a minute. Scooby-Doo's? Yeah, yeah, over there. You know, right by Scooby-Doo's, we went around the back of Scooby-Doo's. I go, what Scooby? What Scooby-Doo? You don't know Scooby-Doo? I know Scooby-Doo and Shaggy and the Mystery Bus. Is it the cartoon? Huh? Scooby-Doo? You don't know Scooby? No, I don't know Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo. They got ice cream. They got toppings. They got the best whatever banana split. Well, turns out it's an ice cream place on the Patterson Hawthorne border near North First Street. Scooby Doo. Now that girl's egocentricity I think is a little different from what we're talking about preschoolers. I mean preschoolers really think we're part of their lives, that we're omniscient, that we're involved, that there's only them. <laughs> Whatever happens to them, the whole universe knows. I, th- I think this girl was de- demonstrating ego- egocentricity. But I think what was insular about her wasn't her little narrow, I'm a three-year-old and I live in this house and that's all I know and everybody else knows what I know. But I think this girl never got out of Patterson. And I think her egocentricity is related to, like, you ever see the New Yorker's map of America? It's like Manhattan, Upper East Side, the park, Greenwich Village, Midtown... And then Los Angeles, and like it's a little line in the middle that represents the rest of the country, you know? So you got New York's the, the, the dominant part of the map. Then there's Los Angeles, and the rest of it's a little blob, a little dot. And ain't nobody more egocentric than a New Yorker, right? They think the whole world, uh, it's New York and the rest of the world. What do they call the Midwest, the flyover states? 
Well, I think there was a little bit of that going on with this girl. You know, her old world is Patterson, and, and Scooby-Doo is well known there in her neighborhood. And everybody knows Scooby-Doo. But I don't live there. So that's an example of egocentricity. Preschoolers' language is personal and unstable. As I just said, the child will refer to people, places, and ways that are familiar to her, but may be unique. And of course, the private parts are very personal, and they have their words for them, and that's the only word they know, and they think you know what they know, and that their bottom or bud or winky or whatever they call it is what everybody calls it. Very troubling are pronouns, me, he, him, her. And as I suggested earlier, their communication appears disorganized. They don't give a sequential narrative. We're talking about three to five here with Mitnick. Moving on to five and seven-year-olds, their thinking remains egocentric. But they're better at determining what they've been told and what they heard. Source attribution, we call that. And that's good, because we worry about source misattribution. Problem is, they have a little difficulty communicating that to the listener. Their thinking is concrete. They interpret questions literally. So you need to ask specific questions. Multiple topics. Topics are confusing. Combining WH questions are problematic for those kids. Three to five year olds. So you don't want to say, what were you wearing and what did he do? Nothing. Okay. Was the child naked? Go ahead. Back on? Okay. Thank you. I'll give it a shot. I got my iPad up, but I'll give it a shot in a little bit. This is five to seven, I think. Yeah. Uh, Mindy Mitnick, who I'll be with next week. She's a clinician up in Minnesota. Um, Mindy also makes the observation that kids between five and seven, their communication involves what's described as centration. And that means that the child often focuses on one aspect of what they experience. And that becomes important to them. Especially kids less than seven years old. They may not remember other details, and it can be different for every child. You may bring in a seven-year-old who was the subject of a blindside fondling or an assault in a grocery store, or somebody tried to get them to come in a car, and you need a physical description, right? The police and law enforcement want to find the guy. So you ask about the car, you ask about the guy. You know, and sometimes the kid will say he had on really weird socks. They had crisscrosses on them, and they were like purple. And you can see them because his pants didn't go all the way to his shoes. Well, tell me whether he had any hair on his face. I don't remember that. Well, was his skin light like mine or darker? I don't know. I, I think it was this or that. But I'll tell you all about the socks and the shoes and the pants. You see what I mean? That's centration. 
Now, sometimes they may focus on the face, and the police are happy. We don't typically look for guys who wear funky socks. But it'd be nice to hear about the funky socks as well as what he looked like. Go ahead. And do, you, do you think that that's solely because of the stage of development where the child's at, or do you think it's also a coping mechanism, like to, to remember? I mean, if you were just recalling, like, I don't know, you explained at one point kids playing with a clown, and then they asked what happened with the clown, and you, do you think in that they would not know what the clown looked like but remember something else, or do you think it's specific to instances where a child's being interviewed about something traumatic where they would block out what somebody looked like? Yeah, I, I think it's complicated. Um, I think one explanation for it is this notion of centration. Um, it may be that they blocked it out or it never was encoded because they were scared and maybe they looked at the feet because they didn't want to look the guy in the eye or maybe they did and it just didn't get encoded or it was encoded and now it's repressed or suppressed. Um, I think, you know, that could be it. Um, you know, eyewitness identification is a very interesting phenomena and process, and there's a lot of research on it in the past 20 years. And there's a lot of factors, many of which have nothing to do with childhood or maturity or ability or development that impact identifications and the quality of an identification. But when you're dealing with a child, uh, it's, you know, there's even more potential obstacles to getting that information in a way that's reliable and complete. I tried a stranger rape case in the early 1990s and the victim described being blindsided by a powerful burly man who looked like the movie actor who was alive at the time, John Candy and how he she was a marathon runner and it was early in the morning, as many runners typically work out, 6 o'clock in the morning, the sun was just coming up. He grabbed her with his forearm around her throat, cut off her breathing passage, and dragged her into the woods up on High Mountain Road in North Hilden, in the shadow of a sorority house, who heard the woman screaming. Some of the co-eds who lived at the sorority house, I went and met with them, but they really couldn't offer anything other than a timeline. They gave me a little bit of better sense about time. The woman was screaming, having read this in a who knows what popular magazine. You shouldn't yell rape because no one responds to rape. They respond to fire. So she starts screaming, fire, fire. And the girls up at the sorority house said, we thought some girl was yelling at her boyfriend, you're a liar, you're a liar. So we woke up and we thought it was a boy-girl fight and we went back to sleep. It wasn't. What do you yell help? Yeah. Help just generally means something's happening, I need help. Right? Yeah. Anyway, this was a stranger to her. Uh, the man was a stranger to her, and, and the, um, you know, the identification was front and center in the trial. And the, the accused brought in an expert on memory and witness identification from the University of Minnesota. His name was Dr. Stephen Penrod, I remember it well. And, and he, among other researchers in this area, had a number of 
theories about eyewitness identification and how the brain works. One of them was called weapon focus. When people are assaulted with a weapon, that what's relevant to them is the weapon, and they tend to focus on the barrel of the gun and the hand rather than the face. The face is an afterthought. And they certainly have a memory of what they believe the face looked like, uh, but the research suggests that those kinds of witnesses might overstate their recollection. I'll never forget that guy. Were you looking at his face? I was. When in fact they weren't. They were looking at that gun most of the time. Um, Cross-racial identification. The research, and I haven't looked at it recently, but in the mid-90s, the research was beginning to form and was pretty abundant that no matter what the race was, Asians identifying Caucasians, Caucasians identifying African Americans, African Americans identifying Eskimos, whatever, if it was a person of a culture different of yours, different from yours, it was unreliable. And there were a few other theories about how eyewitness testimony is overrated. And if you apply it to kids, you know, if you think about children in that situation, you know, their their brains just don't work like ours yet, like adults do. So there may be even more potential um, for a lack of reliability or trustworthiness in a child's recollection of a stranger assault. What if questions are not helpful? The sense of time and chronology poorly developed, and of course, communication still remains egocentric. Any questions about Mitnick or the cognitive milestones? Okay. Let me see if I can log on to the big screen. Yeah, I think we're okay. What's the matter? Everything okay?
Okay, we're going to talk more about language next week, um, but there's an article that you're responsible for about language development. But what I want to focus on now is Philip Rich's article on sexual development. Because as we look at how children develop cognitively, emotionally, psychologically, linguistically, for forensic interviewing of children, it's important that we appreciate how kids develop sexually, how childhood sexuality works. And as Rich points out, like other areas of child development and growth, their sexual behavior develops incrementally and it develops over time. And it's immature when they're little and it, it, it progresses as they grow older. Uh, many behaviors are normal for kids at certain ages. And of course, there's variability like there is with all child development. Uh, not all children develop sexually the way other children do. So what might seem to be dangerous or what might seem to be problematic or indicative of abuse or neglect might really be normal. So we need to kind of get a sense of what the baselines are for childhood sexuality. When a kid engages in sexual behavior, you need to evaluate that. It may be difficult to determine what's natural, what's healthy, and what's, you know, what's not, and what might be indicative of a disturbance of some sort or more seriously, evidence of child sexual abuse. Sometimes children are described as sexually reactive, and Rich talks about them. Sexually reactive children are kids before puberty, boys and girls who have not uh, yet reached puberty, but they've been exposed to or had contact with sexual activities, inappropriate sexual activities or sexual stimuli. They may have been molested, they may have been exposed to pornography, they may have been exposed to sexual conduct in their home, and that child may engage in a variety of age-inappropriate sexual behaviors. And this is a response to their own experiences. They may act out, they may engage in sexual behaviors, they may engage in sexual relationships. They may get involved in excessive sexual play or make sexualized and sexually explicit comments, gestures. They may engage little kids, other little kids, in mutual sexual activity and also may even molest or exploit other children. Rich tells us what inappropriate sexual exposure is. For kids below 11, all exposure is inappropriate and problematic. All forms of sexual activity with adolescents and adults, looking at pornography or sexually explicit material, witnessing any sexual behavior among other people, Excessive sexual play with same age or older kids who have more knowledge. What are the behaviors? Again, we're looking at kids under 11, 10 and under. If you have precocious sexualized gestures, language, or knowledge, there's a problem there. Precocious means beyond their years, so that's a bit of a bootstrap. But any detailed awareness by 10 and below is a problem, and it's precocious. So if they make statements that are age-inappropriate, use sexually explicit language, if a 9-year-old refers to going down on somebody, or... Um, uh, I really want a blowjob tonight. 
those kind of sexually explicit statements suggest that they've been exposed to things beyond their years. And they may, in fact, have even been molested. Uh, one of the cases that we rely on in court is called State versus Butis. And Butis involved a little girl, I think she was eight years old, and the question was one of the rape shield statute. Now, normally, the prior sexual behavior of a victim of a sex crime is inadmissible in court. So if a 21-year-old woman is sexually assaulted at a frat party and she had consensual sex with three frat men at a frat party last year, it would be irrelevant to whether she consented or was involved at this frat party or if she was sexually promiscuous or involved in pornography or was a nude model, whatever her prior sexual behavior is, as compelling as the defense might think that is, it's not admissible in New Jersey. The prior sexual history of any person, most of the time it's a woman, the prior sexual history of any person is irrelevant as a matter of law. The way a woman dressed, the way they acted, their number of boyfriends, everything I just said and whatever you can think of that involves human sexuality is irrelevant as a matter of law as to the issue of whether the woman consented to this sexual conduct, the one that she is the victim of and the one for which the person is accused in criminal court. Now there are some exceptions one of them is with children. In Budis, B-U-D-I-S, the eight-year-old girl was sexually molested by her uncle. And I may be getting the relationships a little messed up. It doesn't really matter for our purposes. The eight-year-old girl was sexually molested by her uncle. And he was charged with the crime and prosecute it. Later, her stepfather, her mom's boyfriend, is accused of sexually molesting her. A year later. He's charged. He's prosecuted for sexual abuse of the eight-year-old girl. Mr. Butis says... I want the jury to know that she was sexually abused by her uncle. The prosecutor says, wait a minute, rape shield statute. You can't bring in the fact that this little girl was molested in the past to help defend yourself in this case. That's irrelevant. The defendant, Butis, says, no, it is relevant. Because the way the case unfolded with the stepfather was as follows. They were watching a video, they were playing a video game. It was a boxing video game. And one of the boxers in the video game interacted with the other boxer. And the little girl said, it, it looks like that boxer sucking off the other boxer. And the stepfather hears that and he described that in his testimony to the police. And he also claimed in his confession that she was the sexual initiator. That she made that comment, she started to rub his penis and said she wanted to suck him off. And his position was he rebuffed her. That is, he said, get off of me. What are you doing? I scolded her. And that's what he said happened. You know, she says, no, he made me perform sexual acts on him and he molested me. Well, the Supreme Court of New Jersey said the jury should know that she was previously abused because otherwise it would make no sense at all to the jury they wouldn't believe it for one second 
when he asserts that the child initiated the sexual contact. In fact, the prosecutor during the trial where the judge let, refused to let in the prior molest exploited that fact and said things like, come on, you know, what? that's his defense that she, she wanted it, she started it, she's eight years old, ladies and gentlemen. And he wants you to believe that she came on to him. Give me a break. Eight years old, ladies and gentlemen. Now the Supreme Court said, you know, we don't pass on what happened or what didn't happen here, but it is certainly more plausible that a female child used that kind of precocious sexual language and initiated sex if they were previously molested. And that goes back to sexually reactive children. I mean, whether the Supreme Court was specifically thinking about sexually reactive children, kids who are sexually abused, especially when they're real young, can be sexually reactive or engage in highly sexual behavior, which involves putting their tongue in men's mouths, touching their body parts, rubbing their genitalia, doing exactly what that child said, exactly what that man said that child did, exactly what Butis said the child did. Whether it happened that way or not is not important. What's important is that that was more plausible and the jury didn't get to hear that and therefore he was denied his Sixth Amendment right to confront the witnesses against him. The jury got to hear half the story. And the reason I brought that up is to give you an example of precocious sexual gestures, conduct, language, or knowledge. This is sometimes the way kids who are sexually molested act. So the man in Butis, or Butis, who came second in time, arguably was dealing with a child who was sexualized and came on to him, air quotes. Go ahead. So did he report that? I mean, she must have a caseworker or something. Did he report that to anybody? Because you would think having the knowledge that she has a history of sexual abuse and now is acting this way and putting him in a position, if it was really on the up and up, I would think maybe you would alert somebody of that so that should it come up, hey, this is what happened. Because if, if, if in my opinion, like if all of a sudden it's like that's the backstory and like nothing happened and it wasn't out of the ordinary, then like... Why, yeah, well why? look, this is, this is his defense. He'll have... What's that? There's holes in it. Well, he'll have to answer questions on cross-examination. And that's where his defense begins to fray at the edges. But I'm not sure if he said, but if he didn't say, he could say something like this. As passionately as you confront him with that, he'd say, you know, I should have done that, but I didn't want her to wind up in a foster home again because I know her mother would flip out. So I just pushed her back and I told her, stop. And I told her, that's not right. You know, now I sh you're probably right, I should have sh done that. But I was afraid she might wind up in a foster home again because her mother would flip out, she's got a drug problem, and I didn't know what to do next, but I probably should have done something like that. You're right. Now what? Now you go to jail. Oh, well. No, you don't go to jail because I told her to get off me. You don't get it. I told her to get off me. Never happened. So, who knows where the case goes. I'm the, having that suddenly be admissible that she did have a sexual history, you know, it sort of, if there was, if he had reported it, you know, then it seems like, okay, something that we can bring up, but, so that, so, so, to that same defense, that could be anybody's defense for any child who they know who has a history of sexual abuse, like, hey, I didn't do it, this is actually what happened. Like, anyone could say that now. Oh, okay. Abused children are free to abuse. You know what I mean? That's 
like doesn't make any sense. Well, look, me. anybody can lie in the courtroom. Anybody I can. Ex- <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. Anybody can exploit information they have when they're accused of something and say, well, the reason I did this was because of that. If they knew that. The, 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 the question is imagine it's your brother. Imagine it's your father. Imagine it's you. Maybe you should have done the right thing. The, the, the good way to cross examine is to say, why don't you tell somebody? But you got people, you're not dealing with people who do the right thing always. And the jury may reject that. They may go, I would have told somebody. He should have told somebody. I don't believe him when he says, oh, I didn't want the kid to go to fourth or home. But he'll have an answer, which seems like a compelling cross-examination question, right? Oh, she didn't tell her mother, for Pete's sakes? An eight-year-old child begins rubbing your penis? You don't go tell her mother? Who does that? Are you kidding me, man? I mean, look, you can, you, you can knock him around the courtroom. But... So I think it would, all, it would show that he clearly doesn't make good choices. But it doesn't mean he molested her, that if he doesn't make good choices. Because he didn't tell the mother. And if he was, you know, if, if, if there was a history of foster placements, if he was saying that he did it for the benefit of the kid, albeit not the best decision he made, but I did it because I didn't want the kid to get in trouble. I didn't want to go to a foster placement. You know, I, I, I know that her mother would flip out and, and, and beat her with a switch. You know, I thought I could handle it on my own. I knew why. I knew what was happening. I figured I'd handle it on my own. Tell her to stop that. I didn't want to get Dyfus involved anymore. Only bad things happen. So, look. You know, whether he's right or wrong, whether there was a good case or not, you know, this is what happens. You make an argument, you cross examine people, you sum up to the jury, they make a decision. Uh, chances are I think this case is still winnable but I don't know how persuasive the child was whether she did well in court or didn't do well in court but 8 year olds typically do well Um, you know he may have been convicted again he may not have he probably pled guilty to something and took time served because he was in jail for a while before the Supreme Court reversed it but I don't want to get off on Butis I mean there's a million guys like that out there we've got all kinds of stories And uh, one of the great things about being a prosecutor is we're able to do what you just said in a very dramatic, confrontational way. If if that excites you like it does me, then it's a great job, you know? Um, But the point here is, I'm going back to that kid. Uh, By the way, Butis isn't the only case. I've had many cases where I have sexually precocious children who come on to guys, men. Um, and they report it. You know, and the, the novice detective is like, oh, what a sack of shit this guy is saying. The kid, I'm going, relax, man. The kid probably did come on to him to use that word, that language, or, or was the sexual initiator to make it generic. You know, but they're not going to report he did something in most cases unless something happened. You know, and you're, 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 you're sometimes dealing with children who live in an environment where there are bad people around them. So, if, you know, if you're dealing with marginal people, drug addicted, uncaring, unempathetic people, and the girl starts rubbing some other guy's genitals, he, he molests her too. I mean, the environment that some of these kids live in, uh, you know, he, he sees this as something attractive to him. But the point here is we're talking back to the kids. We're talking about the kind of language that happened there. Remember I started out with the kid is watching a video game and she makes the statement that the one avatar or character looked like they were sucking off the other character. And for all the BS that this guy may have been stating in the courtroom, he probably didn't make that up, you know? I don't know, but there's probably some truth to that kid being sexually precocious. The only difference is he exploited it instead of reported it, you know? Because people don't think that way, especially this adult, Butis. He, he don't know that eight-year-olds who are sexually abused sometimes become sexually reactive and come on to or initiate sex or rub the genitals of grown men. That is so far into everybody outside this classroom that it's not even funny. So, 
He's not in a position to think that up. To, well, she's been previously abused. I can say that, and it'll be. I, I'm pretty convinced that happened, <laughs> and I'm pretty convinced she made that statement. I'm also pretty convinced that he molested her too, because he saw an opportunity rather than uh, 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 a, an opportunity for his own sexual gratification, rather than an opportunity to help this child deal with her prior victimization. And that's an example of a kid. A, a, if, he, if, if the report was she simply said that, that would be an example of a sexually reactive child, perhaps, making a sexually precocious statement. It looks like that one boxer dude sucking off the other boxer dude. That is beyond the development of the average eight-year-old. That is cause for concern. Thirteen-year-old, not so much. I mean, she needs to be told, or he needs to be told, we don't talk like that, where did you learn, you know might bear some scrutiny, but an eight-year-old, fireworks ought to go off. Red flags. What's going on here? Now, kids touch themselves. They masturbate. They, they touch the sensitive parts of their body. It's normal. What we're concerned about not is masturbation. At any age, infants, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, four-year-olds, and beyond. But with kids under 11, we're concerned about excessive masturbation, excessive preoccupation with their body parts or ideas. Also, the context of it. Look, uh, a, a seven year old's rubbing her vagina in her bedroom. You come upon that. Right? It happens once in a while, you discover that. Not a big deal. So once in a blue moon, something like that happens, not so bad, not a big deal, not a red flag at all. It's a normal, healthy part of child development. Every morning and every night, she's touching herself. She's touching herself in the shower. She's touching herself laying on the couch watching TV, absent-mindedly touching herself, mechanically touching herself. Major problem. Red flag. So excessive masturbation or sexual touching is an issue and ought to be examined. Context is important. Maybe a single masturbatory act by a seven-year-old is no big deal, but if they're doing it while you're walking in ShopRite and you're pushing the cart and they're rubbing their vagina in public, even though it's once, it's a problem. right? So context is important, too. How much it happens may raise a red flag. Certainly where it happens, regardless of how often, would raise a red flag. I had a case early in my career, I don't think I was in Special Victims Unit yet, where a man was accused of molesting a little girl and the defense lawyer in Chambers was chuckling with the judge. The judge wasn't chuckling, but he was defense lawyer was saying, you're going to go to court with this kid? She's a mess. Her, someone else had molested her. You know, she had nightmares and a lot of other life issues. Might have had mental health problems subsequent to that. And she would, her mother reported that she would grind on anything. To me, I saw that as corroboration. Um... And one of the things that stood out vividly in my mind was the defense lawyer pointing out that the, he learned from the mother that she would, and that's why I said the shop right before, while in the grocery store, she would rub her vagina on the carriage. I mean, she couldn't stop masturbating. Of course, uh, a 10-year-old sexually molesting a 7-year-old is cause for concern. A 12-year-old doing anything sexual with a 6-year-old or a 7-year-old is cause for concern. The assertion that this is sexual play or exploration, 
maybe, but highly unlikely. It's a red flag. Now, two six-year-olds, two 11-year-olds, two nine-year-olds, more likely to be sexual exploration, sexual play. Even touching, mutual touching, things like that, not always indicative of molestation or unhealthy sexual development. What's problematic is where you have highly intrusive acts, you know, two nine-year-olds, one's touching the penis of another, the other one's touching the other one's penis, they're giggling, they're hiding, they're, they're feeling good. Most likely sexual exploration. Most likely normal sexual development. On the other hand, if it's intrusive, even with age mates, putting the penis in the rectum, putting in the mouth, putting objects in the body parts, these things need to be examined. That's not sexual exploration. It's possible, but it's highly unlikely, although defense lawyers may assert that and may say, well, they're just kids. They don't know what they're doing. One of the youngest registrants on Megan's Law is in the case of Enray T.T. I think it was a six-year-old. A 12-year-old put a, a, a douche and some other object into the anus of the six-year-old. Now, you know, it's a sexual act. It's a penetrating act. It needs to be examined. What the culpability is of the 12-year-old remains to be seen. He may be a victim himself. What's important is, is that we appreciate that that's not normal. That's not healthy sexual development. That's not sexual exploration. That's not kids being kids. And if you have mutual fondling of the penis, like a pair of seven-year-olds or a pair of nine-year-olds, or nine and an eight, and eight and a nine, and it's giggly and not in, more intrusive than that, that's almost always sexual exploration or play. On the other hand, you got the same behavior and a 12-year-old and a 5-year-old, that's a problem. So age disparity impacts whether it's inappropriate sexual activity. This article is about um, uh, uh, sexual development in children and what's appropriate and what's inappropriate recognizing healthy and unhealthy sexual development in children. That's what Rich's article is about. One of the things that um, Rich says when he, he quotes Tony Cavanaugh Johnson, who's a researcher, a psychologist here. <clears throat> if kids can't stop themselves from doing some sexual act, like when an adult tells them don't do that anymore, you know, don't be masturbating in the car on the way home from the beach or whatever, yet they continue to do that, then it requires greater scrutiny. If they're driven to do something and not be able to stop, And there's another number of other. So not being able to stop, period, or not being able to stop, period? Well, not being able to stop, period. I mean, if if it's if it's if it's something that the parent tells the child to stop doing, uh, whether they're alone or with someone else. Uh, it all depends. It depends upon the parental interaction. If it's something that they catch them doing in bed, you know, uh, that that's probably not something a parent should issue a directive about. Maybe have a conversation with them about human sexuality, or or I don't know what. I, I don't I don't know the answers to that. You know what the parent should do. Um, I, I just know when things get out of hand is where we need to 
interview the kid and look at the family situation to see whether there's a reason that things are so excessive or the child's doing what they're doing. Um, you know, I'm, I can't honestly tell you I, don't, I know what Tony Cavanaugh Johnson is referring to. So you're saying if the kid's in bed at an, in an age-appropriate context, in an age-appropriate way, touching themselves, and the parents says, don't do it, and then three or four months later you catch him again, I, I don't think that that's a sign of a kid driven. I think she's real talking about the kid who's masturbating on the cart and the shop ride and in the car and, and despite, you got to stop that. You can't do that. Yet they continue to do it um, defiantly. I think that's what she's talking about. Any other questions about children's sexual behavior? Unhealthy and healthy sexual behavior? Okay, I'm not going to go over the Massengill article. It's a good article. It's, it's, it's more about child development to give you a sense of their abilities at various age stages. We went over some of those things here. She talks a little bit more about language here. Um, it's a great article, actually. It, it kind of summarizes all the charts we looked at in a narrative. The parts about language I'm going to talk about in the next learning unit. So, But I'd like to look at this child development interview chart. Now, this is based upon, this is based upon the typical child, right? And we talked about the fact that there's lots of variability among children. So what some five-year-olds are capable of, other five-year-olds aren't. But, you know, we can draw some conclusions about the typical child. The forensic interviewers that I work with have this chart. We keep this on an index card because it's a nice, handy reference just to refresh our recollection about children's abilities when we're interviewing them, what they're capable of answering. And... You know, the discussion board asked about why child development is important and critical in understanding how to forensically interview a child, why that's an important part. And, and you know, this chart kind of tells us why in shorthand. I mean, one of the constants in that child development milestones and in the Mindy Mitnick child development outline, was that kids have a short attention span. Remember, we went from three to five, five to seven, whatever, one to three. Every one of them said short attention span, short attention span, short attention span. And it also describes some of the limitations with kids. Egocentric, syncretic, centration, focus on one thing, think the world sees everything their way. If you don't understand that, if you don't understand how kids develop, how they think, how they perceive the world around them, how they look at the adults who talk to them, how they process information, you're at a severe disadvantage in a forensic interview. Because if we start out with the proposition that there's a very short window of opportunity, you need to maximize the potential. If a preschooler, you probably have 15 minutes at best for a preschooler of quality interview time. Do you want to waste that 15 minutes mucking around in the sand? You want to waste that 15 minutes questioning the child about issues that are beyond their capabilities and competence? Not only will you get answers that are nonsensical, not only might you get answers that are feeble attempts to, lo to live up to the expectations of the adult who's interviewing them, you run a great risk of undermining that child's credibility by making them look incompetent, when in fact they aren't incompetent at all. It's the interviewer who's incompetent. It's the interviewer who doesn't appreciate the abilities, the abilities and challenges of interviewing a child at that particular age range. So you're wasting time, 
and perhaps, worst of all, making that kid look less than competent. It's never the child's fault. It's always the interviewer's fault. And why I say this chart kind of sums it up, this tells us children's capabilities in six critical areas of a forensic interview. When we go in as law enforcement or child protection or psychology or medicine, and we want to ask kids questions about stuff that's important for our treatment, important for our protection of the family, or important for our prosecution of some person who presents a threat to children, we typically want to know who did something, what something happened, you know, who, what, where, when, how often, right? And some context. Anytime you interview a witness, you need that kind of stuff. And if you need that kind of stuff, in all cases, where there's a forensic investigation of some sort, it's nice to know whether kids are capable of answering those kind of questions. And if you look at three and four-year-olds, don't ask them how often it happened. Because, number one, they can't answer that question. And worst of all, worst of all, they may feel obligated to give you an answer, and it's silly, nonsensical, non-responsive, and makes them look incompetent. You ask a, even a five or six-year-old, how many times did it happen? How many times did Daddy come in your room when you were on vacation and lick your coochie? Four hundred. 72, 5, 15, 36. It doesn't matter. Because whatever the response is, at best it's speculative. At worst, and probably most likely, it's just an attempt to give us a number. Because they can't tell us. The average kid doesn't know how many times. And when a kid gives us a number that seems reasonable, I think most jurors appreciate that if he goes 300 times. Or if they give us time, the, the amount of times is like Walmart pricing. You ever go to Walmart and go buy something that's $3.96? I could understand $3.99, $2.99, Who charges somebody $3.96? Who does that? Walmart. What? Well, that could be a function of tax and things. Walmart's stated price, 96, 94, whatever. I think most jurors can appreciate that if you ask a kid, a five-year-old, how many times did daddy kiss your coochie when he came in your room, and they go 76 or 300, I think most jurors can appreciate that, that that's guessing, that that's an agent for a question. And again, we're wasting time because we're getting answers that are not helpful. Thankfully, they said something that was so uh, nonsensical that everybody appreciates that that's not a true answer. And the last thing we want is kids guessing, you know, we're making nonsensical statements because we're vouching for their credibility. So we're, we want everybody to give the kid a pass when they make something up. Ah, she's like, she's got a lot of time. Well, how do we know she's not making something else up? No, never good. And even if the jury gives them a pass for saying 76 or 300, it's never good because we know now that the kid's pretty comfortable saying something that I just made up. Yes? What if they say a lot? That's better. That's, a, that's an age-appropriate answer to the number of times. And that's the best they can do. So when we learn the protocols later, you'll see what we encourage, we don't, we discourage highly discouraged asking how many times. Ever. I don't care how old the kid is. We simply ask them if it happened more than once. Tell me what happened. Did they say daddy with my Gucci? Did that happen one time or more than once? Did daddy ever do something different from licking your Gucci? Well, one time he made me put my mouth on his wiener. Did that happen once or more than once? Tell me about the time that you remember best. It happened more than once. It always happened in the morning. Tell me the time you remember best about having to put your mouth on that. 
Tell me the first time. Tell me the last time. Tell me a time it was different. Tell me a time you remember best. We'll talk more about those strategies to get the kid to express themselves in a way that gives us information so we can figure out the sum of what happened. I started out last week or whenever telling you that we'll never know the whole story, ever. Here we are. But we'll know more than enough. And once or more than once gives us enough information to move forward. And it's respectful of that child's development. When something happened, it's difficult for four-year-olds, five and six-year-olds can give you some sense of that. And when they give you when, they're not going to give you a date or a time or any more precision, but they're going to be able to give you like when I was in school or when I was at grandma's house, especially for multiple acts, chronic molestation. When is a loaded problematic question. Context, that's the last one, circumstance. You know, even up to age eight, you don't get a lot of context. You know, what else was going on? Where was mommy? Where was this? What was it? I don't know. I don't know. It was in my room. It was in my room. And he came in and he did this, that, and the other thing. Tell me more about it. I don't know. That's what he did. You know, when you make 11 or 12, then you might be able to provide some of those some of those nuanced details that we grown-ups are able to remember. So when is difficult, and even when you do have when, we look at when in the context of their life, of their school, not so much based upon the calendar. And kids don't think that way. The world doesn't revolve as much about the calendar as ours does. So you see, if you haven't had children in justice yet, there's a case called State of the Interest of KAW, and KAW is a Supreme Court decision where the Supreme Court said that kids and witnesses for that matter, but in that context it was children, children don't have to give a specific date or dates when describing their sexual victimization. That is good enough if the child's able to narrow it down by expressing that it happened during winter break, or it happened during the summer in the fifth grade, or it happened when they started basketball clinic, or it happened when they lived over on Rosa Parks Boulevard. And if we can link that up with something that we know, like we might know when they lived on Rosa Parks Boulevard, we might know when they were in basketball clinic, then we can we can put some time around the allegations. And we're allowed to do that. We don't, have to get, we don't have to give a specific time. So what you want to avoid is asking children specific questions about where, when, the number of times and circumstance, if that's beyond their capability. Number one, it injects confusion into the process. Kids will sometimes speculate or guess because they want to please the adult who's interviewing them. And the other thing that happens is sometimes we undermine their credibility. Because when they do give us an answer that's speculative or guess or fantastic, we make them look less than believable. We make it look like they're very capable of misleading adults and guessing when they don't know the answer to a question. And that's the last thing that you want in a forensic interview is guessing. The other thing is it's inefficient. Even if they stare at you blankly and you say, you know, I know that's a hard question. We can forget about how many times it happened, Danielle. I want to ask you this, sir, and move on. You wasted five seconds, ten seconds, fifteen seconds. The more that you probe into areas that are beyond the development of the child, the more inefficient your interview becomes. The more that that window of fifteen minutes moves downward towards being completely closed. So we want to ask what the kid's capable of responding to. We want to respect their development. We want to ask questions that are directed to their age and ability. And we'll get more information. And we'll get better information. And if we're respectful of their development, 
we're going to have a better outcome. No doubt about it. Any questions about this general stock range? Uh, that's the great means there. There's variability there. Some kids can and some kids can't at that age. So the average five and six year old, some of them can tell us how many times. Many of them can't. So there's there's the ability among some percentage. Uh, this is the way I'm expressing it. And this is what it means. And one way to look at it. Like most three year olds can't tell you when, if not any. Some of them can tell you where. Some, that's why it's great. All of them should be able to tell you what and who. Again, realizing that even all of them, there's one or two that just can't. can't because they're not normally developed. But among normally developed children, all three-year-olds ought to be able to give you a little bit of who or what. Some of them might give you where. So this is uh, the great the great reflects where there's um, some kids who can and some kids. Yeah, I don't know that's a gray area, but I got you. <laughs> Any other questions or observations about this? <laughs>